How We Make Movies is brought to you by Microsoft Surface, Assimilate, Azo, Moviola, and Canon Hollywood. It's shot in front of a live audience in Los Angeles and hosted by the film collective We Make Movies. Hello and welcome back to How We Make Movies. I'm your host, Amanda Lippert. And this is the show where we talk to real indie filmmakers about their stories and the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into the, making their films. Our guest tonight on this episode is Joshua Caldwell. He's the founder of Main Bauer Entertainment and the writer-director of the new film Layover, which premiered at the Seattle International National Film Festival this year. The film was made for, get this, under $6,000 and is the first in a trilogy based on characters that land at the LAX airport. Please give a warm welcome to Joshua Caldwell. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about the film Layover? So Layover is the story of a young Parisian named Simone who's traveling from France to Singapore to visit her boyfriend. She believes, she believes her boyfriend is going to propose to her. Mm -hmm. She's sort of unsure about whether that's the direction she wants her life to go in. And she has an unexpected layover in LA when her connecting flight is canceled. And the film basically is about her experience in Los Angeles over the course of 12 hours. Now, most of the film takes place in French, right? Yes, almost the whole film is in French. But you're American. Why did you choose to make a foreign film um, that's based in America, no less? Right. Well, I mean, I was really interested in the idea of doing a foreign film set in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You see so many American films that are set in for, for other foreign countries. And um, I kind of, you know, I wanted to challenge. I mean, as if making a movie for six grand wasn't enough of a challenge. <laughs> um, I knew that I was also doing something you know, for my first feature, I was doing a low budget drama with no mm -hmm. stars and I needed to do something that would help elevate it and make it stand out. And uh, it clearly worked because everyone's question is, why did you make a movie in French when you don't speak French? Yep, rather so it than... starts the discussion, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And I was really inspired by, you know, the French New Wave cinema and um, at the time and it sort of felt like it gelled. And Are you a big fan of Jean-Luc Godard? I am. I mean... You know, I started watching a lot of those movies. What really sparked it was, one, watching Contempt mm -hmm. and the experience of seeing that 30-minute long conversation that happened. I'm like, okay, whoa, you can actually do that and have it work. I <laughs> and mean, not I'm not going to claim to be as yeah. great as those guys are, but I was like, that's really fascinating. You can do long dialogue scenes. You can, you can um, have it be about real people and real conversations. And so that certainly influenced it. And then I also saw a movie called For Lovers Only, which was mm -hmm. made by the Polish brothers, which is about two lovers who uh, reunite in Paris, mm -hmm. sort of rekindle a past romance. And that was all shot on a 5D. It was all black and white. It's basically made for nothing. When was that shot? That was maybe 2011, I oh, think. Wow, I haven't um, seen that one yet. It's on Netflix. It's great, and and I just it started opening my eyes, and I also started hearing you know Ed Burns talk about making these really low budget movies, and mm -hmm. so um, that got me into saying, well, maybe I can make a movie for like, okay, can I make a movie for zero dollars? Um, and we went up a little from there, but uh, you know, it just became that interest in in doing something very low budget, mm -hmm. looking for something that might stand out. I was I was more interested in. Uh, the story of of a foreigner, mm -hmm. you know, in in America and what their experience was, rather than a girl from New York or Chicago passing through, because I, that just wasn't as exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and then at the end of the day, I basically knew two actors that spoke French. So, quite frankly, if they spoke Italian, it would have been a neorealism film, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got the trailer here. Do you guys want to see what a six thousand dollar feature looks like? Yeah. All right, let's watch it. <laughs> Combien de temps vous êtes ici? Deux heures. That's a shame. Quoi? J'ai pas une copine à aider. Ah si, euh, ouais, elle voulait être actrice. Ah eh bah ben, tiens, ma parfait, tu devrais l'appeler. Ah, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Ça fait des lustres, c'est bon. Ça te raccompagner sinon? T'as un deuxième casque. Tu dois t'emballer pas mal de gonzesses avec ta bécane. Pourquoi tu crois que j'ai un deuxième casque T'es fiancée C'est une très bonne question. Tu 
repenserai à moi. Pardon Tu as dit que tu repenserais à cette nuit. Penseras-tu à moi I don't speak it. So like, you have no idea what's going on. Well, I, I think that the big question, obviously, is going to be, how did you make this film for $6,000? It's gorgeous. Thank you. Um, like, what cameras did you use? How did you, you know, like, cut costs? Like, what, what did you do? That's, I've seen $6,000 films before, and they didn't look like that. Well, thank you, first of all. <laughs> um, so we shot on the Canon 5D pretty much out of the box. Um, we shot, uh, we had the 24 to 105 image stabilized the lens. So I was, I operated the whole thing. So I was literally holding, I mean, I have a rig, follow focus, anything. It was literally just me holding the camera, looking at that tiny monitor that's causing a lot of eye strain. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, we had a couple other lenses that we used for like the club scenes and the lookout because, you know, we just, the, the, the 24 to 105 is a F4, so it's just not, it's not very fast. But what it allowed for was not having to have a shoulder rig to shoot all the handheld. I could just basically walk with it because it was image stabilized. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if I should say this here at Canon, but we did use the Magic Lantern software. Mm -hmm. Um, Somebody I don't know, it. it's supposedly official now or not official or Canon secretly funding them or something. I don't know, I'll let them <laughs> respond to that. Um, but that definitely helped because we had the focus assist and, and obviously we shot 240, so we had the map, you know, we were able to pump up the bit rate a bit. Um, you know, and, and in terms of the look, I mean, I'll, I'll give a lot of credit to our DP, William Wolf, who, you know, was a, a buddy of mine who I'd done some other work with on the 5D mm -hmm. and asked him to come out and Cut, paid nothing and you know sort of had basically some china balls and some can lights and you know a, a one by one panel to work with in addition to whatever was sort of existing um and we just sort of made it work i mean you know what's what's really great about it was a lot of what you see there is just kind of la at night mm -hmm. you know and it's the la that i see when i was riding around on my motorcycle and which that's the motorcycle and when you see the guy riding that's actually me um, I was the stunt man, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's just like the cool, and, and a lot of people, you know, there's that whole thing about the, how they're changing the sodium vapor to all the LEDs and how people were like, oh, it's going to lose something. I actually think it's a lot better. I pref well, first of all, as a, you know, as a cameraman, like, you, you don't want that orange light. It's kind of gross. And so having that clear white light um, just gave it a really cool look. And, and that, so by the way, all that stuff you see is untouched. We haven't, none of that was colored in the trailer. It is colored in the film, but we did a pretty simple pass. And that's, I mean, it was, <laughs> I look back, I'm like, God, I wish I had known about like the cinema log and like all that stuff, you know, in order to really make sure I was shooting it correctly. But it wasn't, we basically set it to like neutral in the picture style and that's what we got. You know, it didn't leave us a lot of freedom in post to color, but I knew I wasn't gonna be able to afford the color. So I tried to shoot something that was gonna be as close to it as I could. And that was something that I had just done before with previous films when I was shooting DV, when you didn't, I mean, what color correction in DV, you know? And so I knew that I just could take the time to get the picture as close to what I, what I was really looking for on mm -hmm. set and then do minor, minor tweaks in post. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, in terms of the sound, we basically had a package of, uh, or I wouldn't even call it a package. We were, so we started out recording on with a real sound guy, you know, mm -hmm. with the full mixer, boom, all that stuff. And that was going to be the goal, was to have somebody, that was where we were going to put our money, because everyone, you know, it's important to have really great sound. And we did it for uh, two days, one or two days, and we realized we couldn't afford it for the rest of the shoot. And so I was... was you didn't do the budget beforehand? No, we, we, <laughs> we were sort of figuring it out as we went along. Um, and, but I was arguing for it. And one of our producers, Vertel Scott, uh, was like, well, I've got the H4 and Zoom. I'm like, I don't know, man, I don't trust it. Have you guys heard of the Zoom before? Because I just learned about this this year. It's this like $100 well, little- Well, it's like 300. It's 300. But it's a $300 recorder. You can that get has it XLR inputs. Online. Yeah, it's yeah. great. 
recording levels, all that stuff. It's like 300 bucks. Um, and so he was like, well, I have that. And I have some mics. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, you really got to convince me that this is going to be OK. He's like, just trust me. <laughs> so I did. And pretty much all of the sound in the film, the, the worst sound that we had to deal with was all the sound recorded by the sound guy. Tell me. Tell me everything I don't need. You don't need a sound guy. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, um, no, it's 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 literally this 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 film so was made with. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll give you my card later. We'll, I'll hire you on the next day. Um, you guys are not going to be able to hear this in the podcast. Now, so now, my mic just drops out all of a sudden. Um, no, I mean uh, this 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 film was made with a Canon 5D out of the box and an H4N zoom boom pole and lab mic. And that was it. And the and lenses? What lenses did you use again? We have the 24 to 105 lens, which comes in a kit, you know, okay. if you buy the 5D. And we had some some Nikon primes that were older, um, and like a 50 millimeter 1.8, basically. And and some of the stuff on the lookout mm -hmm. um, that was shot with that. Mm -hmm. Those those faster lenses, because the the 24 to 105 is just it's it's kind of a slow lens. Yeah. Which is funny because we shot this whole thing at night, and I probably should have thought about that before we did it. But it was like the only way because. What would you have done differently now that you know? Now that you've had this experience, as far as uh, the way that you shot it. I mean, I probably would have just, I probably would have shot it with like the cine style mm -hmm. approach because it would have given me a little more latitude and color. But I mean, I certainly now I've got like a better lens package and I've got faster lenses and I've got like a whole follow focus rig. But at the same time, a lot of the stuff on layover had to be shot with just the camera. Right. Because we, were, we stole everything. And when I mean everything, we stole everything. <laughs> and, um, you know, but uh, it would have just been sort of giving myself a little bit more options um, with the image. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing a certain things like, you know, when I was on the plane, I made a mistake and I forgot to bring the faster lens. And so all I had was the slow lens. Mm -hmm. But, and that was the other thing was I had to, you know, because we were using a slower lens, 24 to 105 for the majority of the stuff, we were shooting at like, we were sometimes at 3200, 6400 ISO. In fact, all the club stuff, even though we were on like a 1.8 lens, we still had to shoot at like 6400. Mm -hmm. And Will, my DP was freaking out. He's like, there's gonna be so much noise. I'm like, relax, dude. He's like, I don't, I was like, I don't care. If there's noise, there's noise. Like, if we're gonna suddenly stop and say we can't do this because there's gonna be a little bit of noise in the thing, then like, why are we here? So did you- If we were shooting 16, like, you know, Cassavetes, yeah. you have tons of film grain if you're shooting at night with low light. Yeah. So like, didn't stop him. Right, but with the noise in a club, like- well, that, that was like all post, like okay. basically. So yeah, you... a lot of stuff we went in, we didn't record sound. I'm, but like in terms of the digital noise, mm -hmm. in terms of shooting at such a high ISO, and it was in there. I see. And we found this really great, there's a really great plugin called, I think it's like Neat Video or something like that, noise reduction. It took care of everything. It's really great. It's worth the money. This is going to be one of those podcasts where people have to go back and like, take right. notes later. Exactly. <laughs> but you can always like pause it, rewind, go back. And we've seen this film. We had a DCP made of this, and we screened when we screened at Seattle. What is DCP? Uh, digital Cinema Package. So okay. basically, like the the your film print essentially. Okay. And uh, so when we screened in Se screened in Seattle, we had that. When we screened at Dance with the Films here in LA at the Chinese Six on their big 500 foot screen, that's what we used. And so we took the original 1080p file. Mm -hmm. It was blown up to 2K. That's what we played it out as. And I sat there and looked at it on that massive screen, and there might have been just a little bit of softness but honestly it looked great it looked really really good you know and and that was one of the big fears because everyone's talking about resolution and you need a red or you need an alexa and you need 5k and 6k and 7k and 20k and whatever that's going to be and the <laughs> fact is is what i learned on this is that the audience just doesn't care what do they care about they care about a good story they care about characters yeah so you can shoot it on a, you can spend the money and you can shoot on red and everyone's going to say wow it looks great and you can shoot it on 5d and everyone's say wow it looks great i'm not going to know and so it's like, you know, you can have all, clearly, we all know, we all go see those movies that have all the big fancy special effects and cost $200 million to make, and they're empty and uh, don't have great characters and don't have a great story, and we leave feeling like we wasted the money. And then we see these smaller stories and smaller character driven stuff, we go, why can't we have more of that? Well, those are the ones that, yes.
it's why it's why television has become so popular. You yeah. know, you have its character. I mean, television doesn't have and the Netflix. budget to do stuff big. Yeah, and yeah. binge watching and. But it's it's that deep dive into character, and I think mm -hmm. you know obviously features are moving away from that. Do you find it's more inspirational, and you just kind of write what you see, or do you kind of follow a process that you've learned over time? It, I don't know, because it, it's layover feels in a way a bit of an outlier for me. Mm -hmm. I, I have in the past with my shorts, and with the features I've written, have tend to focused a lot more on thriller, mm -hmm. and and still character, but but more thriller, and so this kind of you know, uh, cinema nouveau, like, you know, f French new wave approach to just following people around is like a very, very different thing. On this one, it was probably the first time where I basically had the first 40 minutes down and had no idea where it was gonna go from there mm -hmm. and just started writing. Mm -hmm. um, because what's tough about something like this is it's episodic. So it becomes, well, why do they go to a club instead of a house party? Or why do they go here instead of here? And it's like, I don't know. Like, they go a million different directions. They're not following any kind of conventional plot where you're like, okay, now they got the money. And because they have the money now, they have to go to this place mm -hmm. to try and pay back the debt or whatever that storyline is going to be. How, how, how do you, like, maintain a relationship and a family and, you know, well, it was, a life? Well, it was weekends, and, and it was only a couple, it was like yeah. five weekends, so it wasn't terrible That's when I saw her during the weekday. That's insane hours, um, though. Yeah, and, and, and then, you know, again, then trying to sleep in a little bit, but you're really, it's not like you're suddenly on nights for weeks, you know, and okay. you're like, okay, I can get used to it. It was like, and so I, there were a couple, uh, couple Mondays where I missed work because uh, we'd <laughs> shoot in the Sunday. But I think, um, just going back, to, to make sure I cover off on some things, it's, um, you know, it was really uh, a really pro a process, just back to the writing really quick, it was really a process of basically knowing what I had, right? Like Robert Rodriguez talks about this, writing what you have and working that in. So I knew I could probably get a house. I knew I could rent a hotel room. I knew I could buy tickets to San Francisco. Um, I knew I could, uh, um, you know, I know I could probably find locations on the street. I knew I had a motorcycle. And so I had all these elements. And if I didn't, then we'd go back and we'd change, tweak it and change it in the script. And um, I knew I had actors that spoke French. And that all kind of just got wrapped up in, in being very easy with the sense of saying, I'm going to be really loose with this and kind of like let the story exist on its own. When I wrote the first draft, I was very unsure about whether it worked, but I gave it out to people and they came back and said, this would be great. In fact, my producer, Travis Oberlander, was like, listen, I probably could have given you some notes, but at the end of the day, it felt like it would have probably ruined the story and it would have ruined the organic nature of it, mm -hmm. you know? And so for some reason, it's hard for me to say, but for some reason, it just connects with people. I think what we really did a good job with was just creating these three-dimensional characters, letting them have lives that extend beyond the beginning and end of your film mm -hmm. and talk about ideas that resonate with the audience in some way. Ideas of the future and, and being held down by a job you don't want and decisions on whether the person you're with is really the person you want to be with. And a lot of things that are wrapped up in sort of our culture right now in terms of like the millennial generation and where they are and, and a lot of people sort of refiguring out their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe why it connects to people to some degree. Yeah. And the other thing that made it really easy was I just felt like the script was really solid and I felt like the actors were doing a great job. And we basically were in a position where we could show up, turn on a couple lights and start shooting. So all of our days, even though I was shooting, you know, starting at eight after a long work day, all of our days were under eight hours. And um, that's because basically we shot up and within a half hour of getting there, you know, we were, we were filming. And, and we just rolled through and we shot tons of coverage. We shot a lot of coverage. And how this. many days did you shoot all together? Uh, probably about 11 days. So it's still like under what most people spend shooting. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It was like very, and, and we probably could have shot longer, but mm -hmm. because we basically did it for such a low amount of money that it didn't really matter. Like right. we could have gone another weekend if we wanted to, but it ended up working out. Um, but there's always challenges when you come up with things, you know, you, I wrote a very, very long monologue for Natalie at the end, which was like probably going to would have been like a 15 minute monologue <laughs> in French. <laughs> and it was like having to go through and work that down and get it down. And it was kind of like, listen, like I said to her, I said to her, I was like, why don't you just you get it. You've read this whole thing. Why don't you just write it like go through it and, and make it you make it work for you. And so that's what she did. Mm -hmm. And and so it's being loose. It's being open. 
you know, it's, it's not caring about, it's not that I don't care, but like, you know, when you, when you only have six grand, it's hard to be picky about certain things. Like, what do you think of this wardrobe? Awesome. Is it free? Yes. Great. <laughs> you know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to, when you have the money is when you can really go in and really fine tune and say, well, I want this cup here to meticulous. be here instead of a green cup or whatever that is. And, but, but you, again, I think the, what I said before, which was like, you start to learn what's really necessary and you start to learn what's not necessarily necessary. Actors did their own makeup, you know, we no trailers. You're putting makeup artists out of jobs too. Yep. This crew was like, for the most part, it was three people. It was myself. I'd say three and a half because Will wasn't there every day. But uh, it was myself on camera, Travis, who was handling logistics and slate and shot lists and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and then Bertel, who was running sound. And then Will would be there for the majority of it. But there were a couple things where we kept it really small yeah. uh, to help. But basically, he stood there and held a panel light the mm -hmm. whole time. Um, and then we would, you know, when we shot the house party, we, we flew in a couple PAs that volunteered and, you know, when I'm you all for flew, paying people, by the way. You flew in? Like, no, like they just, we brought them in. Oh, okay, We, brought okay. them in. we, like, we <laughs> hired them. Um, <laughs> I was like, where were they coming yeah, from? Yeah, we, budget went to plane tickets <laughs> yes. for, for the PAs. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but it was basically like the response is, well, you're not paying people in my responsibility. Well, they came out for five hours on one night. So they didn't want to do it. They didn't have to. And we weren't coming in and saying, you got to volunteer and work for free for three weeks. I've, I've volunteered on a lot of projects, um, doing friend favors or a project that I just really liked the script or I was early in my career and just wanted to get some experience. And there's, you know, a lot of... A uh, debate, I think, in the independent film community about whether or not it's kosher or not to, you know, not pay your crew and not right. pay your cast. Um, and you argue a lot on Twitter. What, what's your side of the argument? Uh, well, you got to pay your cast. I mean, our, our, I mean, if you're using SAG actors, you have to. Like, yeah. that's just there's, and we did. We paid yeah. our actors like their day rate. Well, not their day rate, but SAG's ultra low budget indie day rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as far as crew goes, like basically, you know, because it was the four of us, you mm -hmm. know, with Will, we kind of, I sat down and said, listen, this is the deal. Like, I'm not forcing you to do it. You don't have to do it. Um, we definitely gave them back end, you know, on what this film. So we, we negotiated points yeah, okay. with them. And, and so if the film makes money, we all make money, which is totally fine. Actors got back end. Um, you know, and then in terms of some of the PAs and, and, and the people that volunteered, it was like, hey, can you come out and help us for like a couple hours? And they were like, yeah, sure. You know, so I think it's different when you're trying to crew up and shooting, you know, a five five day short film and you're asking people to come out for nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's different. Um, you know, for this, it was it was the bulk of the people that were there shooting for the entire time were there because they wanted to be, mm -hmm. because they had something to gain from being there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the film sells, then they will gain something. And, and you know, it was basically, you give away producer credits. You yeah, know? So like you Bertel, in addition to running sound, Bertel was a huge help on securing some of the locations and doing a lot of logistic work. And, and so, you know, it was like, you kind of occupy a lot of different um, jobs on it. You're right. a gaffer and a PA and crafty and did you, Travis would run and get Red Bulls. In, in your so. credits at the end, did you it's, rightfully credit everyone? Yes. With like every yeah, well, single? I mean, it's still very short credits. Okay. But yeah, no, I mean, they, they did end up getting credit where credit was due. Yeah. Um, or if they actually wanted the credit, because, you know, I don't know if Rattel wanted boom guy you know, <laughs> and producer. Yeah. Um, no offense to sound guys. God, we are just... Uh, <laughs> Oh, God. I swear I will hire you on the next day. He's going to make it up to you. Yeah. Um, so it's, but listen, I mean, we're all starting out. I mean, if you're, if you, it's inexcusable if you have a real budget to not be high paying people, mm -hmm. you know, um, but we're all, we're all, you know, when you're starting out or you're trying to make something for nothing and nobody's making any money, you're not forcing anybody, you know, and you're not, I, I, at least for us, we weren't asking people to come out for like weeks at a time, right? You know, which and you I had think is different. Decent, reasonable shoot days as yeah. well. It wasn't like fourteen-hour days, right? And a lot of times, it was like the guys that would come out would help prep. You mm -hmm. know, so they'd help prep, and then they leave. If they had to leave at two a.m., we we're like, okay, like uh, if all you can be here for is four hours. That's a huge help to us. Yeah. So, you know, whatever you can do, and so, um, yeah. Now, now, were you ever afraid of getting in trouble with the cops, or getting tickets, or having? 
uh, what is it called? Let me see here. Because I just learned this word the other day. E, 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 e oh, you know? the you know insurance. Yeah. yeah. Um, you didn't have any of that stuff. Like, were you afraid of getting in trouble? It was always a question, you know. Um, I wasn't really afraid of it um, mm -hmm. because, one, if you're in L.A., you see people with cameras all the time. And two, whenever we were shooting out on public areas, like this, you know, we weren't, we didn't have a boom out, the guy with the slate, like guy holding a big reflector or anything like that. We were basically like the, the, the sound gear uh, was, you know, like little backpack, you know, and you, you know, reach in and hit record. Mm -hmm. And the guys were mic'd up with labs. And were they wireless I, labs? Yeah, the wireless labs. Okay. And so, and then I, it was me with the camera holding essentially a photography camera, you okay. know? And so what I learned on this was that uh, the public's perception of what making a movie is, is not some dude standing around with a Canon 5D. One of the really interesting things I learned and I'm going through right now as we prepare for um, self-distribution is the process of E&O insurance. I knew we were going to have to get it. Mm -hmm. And my concern was we don't have location agreements for a lot of this stuff. You know, like the house we got was like an Airbnb thing. <sighs> Um, <laughs> oh it's a God. very cheap rental. Just don't yeah. tell them you're filming. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it like quadruples. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know we shot at some locations like the airport and without permission. And and so I was a little concerned about. And there's brands and the motorcycle says Triumph right there. And so I was like, this stuff might be a problem. And if it is a problem, then I'll go through an After Effects and I'll just blur it out. I don't care. It doesn't have to be perfect. Whatever. Um, and so, but what I learned was in talking to the you know guys is they're like, it doesn't really matter. I'm like, well, I've got this like Triumph thing. And they're like, unless you sit there and say that Triumph is a shitty motorcycle, uh, can we swear? Oh yeah, it's okay. the internet. You can say whatever you cool. want. <laughs> As long, you know, if you, unless you're sitting there and saying that Triumph is the worst motorcycle ever made. And that's one of the big points of your character is they're sitting on the Triumph and it breaks down, like then they have a case, but largely they don't. So you're always worried about not having brands and not showing Nike things and, and you know, gaffing out all this stuff. And I don't know every I film I've ever done with like for the Yeah, the black tape and all this stuff. And, yeah. and what I learned was it doesn't matter. Like unless you're unless you're disparaging the product, it largely is not it's not a concern to the E and O. And guys. you learned that it's not to say you might not get something, but right. yeah, and so that was the lawyer. Now Obviously, you guys need to, if you are going through the process, you need to talk to your lawyer right. and confirm that. But I was surprised by where they do put their focus and where they don't put their focus. Yeah. So, like, location agreements, none of that stuff matters. It's basically, like, what's in the film? What's the film about? And they'll cover you against, you know, are there, are there people in the film that you didn't have permission to, to film? And are they featured? And are they disparaged? And if they are, then, like, they'll protect you against that kind of stuff. So, That's um, cool. But, you know, at the end of the day, I got to a place where I said, if they can, if some guy can go into Disneyland and film a movie that is, that shits on Disneyland in the biggest way and sell it and make a lot of money from it, then I'm fine with my $6,000 French fry. <laughs> and so <Amen. laughs> that was the, if nothing else, yeah. you know, but the one thing that I'll, the one thing to, to mention here is that's important as you're thinking about this is that this is not you can't think about it as your this is the film this is the film that is going to launch my career it might be but where I came from was this was the film that would hopefully play in some festivals and then get me the chance to make a film for $50,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then that $50,000 movie would be the one that got me the half a million dollar one. Right. And so for me, it was how do I leverage this into a career and into mm -hmm. a series of films rather than how do I spend all this time and all this money making this kind of self-indulgent French film <laughs> um, for a lot of money <laughs> and have a huge bill hanging over my head and then spend the next two years trying to get it sold right. to somebody because I have an investor that wants his money back. Right. Um, 
So That's what I wanted to avoid. So how did it turn out? Anyway, it's going to um, be released and self-distributed. Yes. And you, this is the first in a trilogy. So you've got two more films that you're gearing up to make. Right. And how's that coming along? It's good. So so Layover is going to be out on VOD in in November. Um, we're looking at November 11th, mm -hmm. and we decided to go the self-distribution route uh, mainly because we were interested in continuing the experiment. Because we didn't have a bill to pay, you know, back to an investor, um, we weren't obligated to go with a distributor or an aggregator with terrible terms and a huge distribution fee for doing nothing mm -hmm. and put us further away from ever making money on this. So instead, we were like, well, why don't we just do it ourselves and explore that and see what happens? Because mm -hmm. what we're interested in doing, Travis and myself, is finding a way to build leverage and build ownership and build the ability to say, to an investor who comes in and wants to start controlling things, well, we don't really need you because mm. we know how to go do this on our own. So you're getting onto our train, we're not getting onto yours. And because if you're going to make a film for 50 grand, I'm not going to have a boss, you know, like quite frankly. And so, um, you know, so that's where we're in. If we can leverage it into distribution, then it, it gives us a lot more power, so to speak going down the road. So uh, Layover is the first film mm -hmm. in a trilogy uh, called the LAX Trilogy. And basically, uh, it's, it's more of a triptych, but basically mm -hmm. each film begins with the main character of that film arriving at LAX and branching off from there. So the second film is called Assassin. Mm -hmm. It's about a female hit woman, or mm -hmm. a hit woman, I guess, who has a job go wrong and escapes up to Big Bear, where uh, she, in order to hide out and basically await further orders, and she meets and engages in a relationship with another woman. And then eventually both of the women's sort of pasts come back to haunt them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third film is called Ten, or X. So L, layover, A, assassin. Ah, see what you X was there. tough. Um, <laughs> we had a couple options. Um, xylophone was the first choice. And um, <laughs> it's going to be really weird. And that was going to be the Italian one. Yes. Um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and they're not all in different languages. But um, uh, so 10 is the story. What we're trying to do is sort of experiment with, with the storytelling model. And basically, 10 is the story of a, uh, of a single man's relationship, uh, sort of the arc of a single relationship over a number of years. Um, but each sort of plot point of that relationship is experienced through one of the diff 10 different women that he's dated. Oh, um, interesting. And so essentially, what we want to do is kind of create this mosaic for an audience and just not fade in and fade out, like, you know, tell you when it's changing. But basically, like, if, she, if the scene ends and she walks out the door, the next scene starts with him with just a totally different woman and months have passed and you sort of figure out that, figure that out as you go along. What I was interested in doing with that was, was we all have that friend that um, serial dates <laughs> and you invest in that significant other for a mm -hmm. period of time and if they break up, that person sort of just disappears out of that person's life. Mm -hmm. And yet you've, you've sort of engaged with them and you have experience with, experiences with them, and then that all goes away and they become this kind of fragmented memory. And so the idea was, can I create that effect for an audience mm -hmm. and use it as a way to sort of sum up who this guy is you know, throughout his 20s and what he's after and what he's looking for. And so each, each of the films is kind of about the main character who's lost something and is seeking to find it again. We've got some audience questions here. Yeah. They're going crazy on meeting Pulse and just voting on each other's questions. Um, the number one um, question is, and you kind of answered this in, in the interview, but you can answer it again if you want. How did you get clearance to shoot in the airport? Um, I don't really want to go into specifics on that. Okay. I'll say that uh, <laughs> we didn't have permits for any location. So that's what I'll say. All right. Um, Fair we, enough. We also, you guys use your imagination to fill in the blanks. Yeah. Uh, the next one is. You can pretty much figure it out based on how I talked about how we shot it and all that stuff. And I think I mentioned two tickets to San Francisco. Um, <laughs> but yeah. That's kind of, I don't want to get too much into it. Understood. Uh, the next question is, uh, did you go to film school? I did not. I, um, like I said, I'd done, you know, so much at Bellevue and learned so much about editing and the craft. And I was still making clearly terrible movies, um, but I was, I understood it more. And so I ended up going to, I was looking a little bit more for experience. 
So I ended up going to Fordham University in New York City, um, mm -hmm. and which had a uh, Manhattan campus. Uh -huh. And one of the appealing things was just the experience of living in New York, mm -hmm. you know, and I kind of, in a really interesting way, just decided that I was probably going to get more out of the experience and the stories as a director and as a writer, that's really where you're cultivating from. It's not really like whether you can run a camera or not. That's helpful, but you can figure that out. You don't need to pay $40,000 a year to do that. Um, Google. Yeah, and so, especially nowadays. And so, uh, <laughs> went to Fordham. these podcasts. Yeah, I studied communications, <laughs> uh, minored in English, and kind of just kept making films on my own. And mm -hmm. one of those films was a short I made called The Beautiful Lie. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, I got nominated for and won an MTV Movie Award um, my, right after I graduated for a category they had called Best Film on Campus. And I just discovered that MTVU, which was MTV's sort of college subsidiary, was having this contest. Like, hey, want to win a movie award? And I sent it in. I just finished it. And so uh, went through a series of voting, uh, spent the last month of my college career in front of two computers clicking vote over and over again. <laughs> um, but it paid off, uh, and I, I ended up winning. Yeah, so I won the Golden Popcorn, and uh, then that segued into me coming out to L.A. That's pretty cool. Um they're asking also, what is your day job? Uh, I mean, right now it's uh, it's this to a degree. It's doing you know it's doing industrial stuff and it's uh, commercials and mm -hmm. things like that. But um, I don't have uh, I don't have like a full time sort of separate job. I did for a while. Um, I was a director of digital media for Anthony Zyker, created CSI. Mm -hmm. He had a production company and focused on uh, producing digital content. We did a movie called Cybergeddon on Yahoo. Uh, starring Missy Peregrim and Olivier Martinez, which was fun. It was kind of a big, you know, multi-million dollar budget up in Toronto for a month. Um, and then we had a YouTube channel called Black Box TV, which was part of their, um, you know, premium content thing that they did a couple mm -hmm. years ago and producing horror shorts and stuff like that. And so that was my day job, you know, for a while. Uh, How did you meet Anthony? That was like through a friend. I ended up reaching out to somebody because I said, hey, if you have anything, I'm interested in kind of doing whatever. And this was a number of years ago. And he said, yeah, I think there might be something. And Anthony had just created a, a thing called a digi novel, which was like a movie and a book combined mm -hmm. into one experience. You'd read 40 pages and then watch online and watch the next chapter is the video. And they were like launching it and they had a blog and they had all this stuff. And my friend came in and said, hey, this guy's a writer. Like, you should meet him. Like, he'd come in and do this stuff for free. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I was like, hey, I'll do it. Like, you know, like, why not? You know, yeah. and uh, leverage that into a job and then went from there. Awesome. Um, the next one, they're voting, so they keep moving. But the next one, I think for now, don't move, guys, is that do you always write and direct or you, do you direct other people's writing as well? Um, I don't always write and direct. Um, like, Assassin was written by my producing and writing partner, Travis. He soloed on it. Ten's a co write. Um, even if somebody else writes it, um, you know, I tend to come in and do a pass, but mm -hmm. I'd say that most of the stuff that I'm working on right now, because I'm not, you know, I'm not being handed scripts by agencies and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, most of the stuff I'm working on is stuff that I'm developing from the ground up. I'm trying to move away from being the sole source of the writing, mm -hmm. so I can have multiple people working on different projects, so that I can get those set up in a pipeline to just, you know, start shooting and shooting and shooting. Cool. Um, the next question, I'm not sure, have you ever had a film on Netflix? I have not. Not? The next question is explain the process of getting your film on Netflix. So I guess this one wouldn't, wouldn't apply to you. It, well, it's an, I mean, it's an acquisitions thing. I mean, there's, there's definitely services that will do it for you. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people there, so I've, I've talked to them about the film. But what I've understood that they look for is, is one, they have like this algorithm they run everything through. Mm -hmm. So, But what I've understood that they look for is basically they look for sort of existing popularity. And, and so Netflix tends to be sort of a last stop for a lot of films, yeah. rather unless you're like a big Hollywood studio. Mm -hmm. But even then, they're like, they'd rather try and make money on direct sales than mm -hmm. they would on a streaming service. So right. um, I'm not, I haven't gone through the process yet, so I'm not totally familiar with it, but um, you're probably better off Focusing on like an iTunes or or Vimeo or whatever, and then letting that, you know, move, letting the popularity of that mm -hmm. open up the doors for Netflix. And um, they asked, did your DP charge you a daily rate, and what was it? 
Uh, yeah, it was free 99. <laughs> which I'm going to credit to my wife in terms of that term. Um, no, it was, uh, there was no day rate. He was a friend. I said, listen, do you want to do this? I'm shooting this. You get a director of photography feature credit. Um, you know, it's help. And so uh, we ended up paying him a little bit for like gas and all this stuff. And it was like, hey, well, you know, it's weekends. You know, we're trying to not take away from day jobs and all that stuff. I mean, everyone pretty much worked, you know, their normal jobs. Um, but what we did offer was sort of back end compensation. And um, they said, how do you, um, how did you choose the camera you shot on? Uh, I had a friend that had the 5D. <laughs> as simple as that. But uh, to a larger degree, I was, I was, I'd shot on it a number of times for a couple different projects. And, and with William, mm -hmm. had shot some stuff that we had no money to do. Mm -hmm. And it was actually ancillary content for Cybergeddon. So we were shooting no budget stuff that had to feel like it was a part of a multi-million dollar project. Um, and I kind of in that saw how much we could get away with in terms of like the limited lighting and the, the sensitivity to light and bumping the ISO and sort of experimenting with that. And then seeing how good it looked um, made me really comfortable going in and saying, well, let's just use the 5D. But the biggest thing about the 5D is the fact that the light sensitivity because we we just didn't you know i've shot on reds i've shot with alexas um you know and it just it just takes so much light you know i think that one of the things for me that i've said is that like the reds stuff like that are not the reds are the equivalent of your 35 millimeter camera can you shoot with no lighting yes uh but it's really made for having a support system around it to get the images appropriate for that camera. The DSLRs, I'm not sure I'd loop the C100s and 300s into this, but with the DSLRs, I've said they're kind of like your 16 millimeter back in the day. They're kind of like, you know, they're 1080p. They don't have super high resolution. They sometimes are a little soft, but really they're light, they're compact. They shoot a great image and you can use it, you know, to your advantage. And so, you know, clearly, like with the layover stuff, like it still looks great. Like, mm -hmm. and it's probably better than 16. If, you know, I don't know if it is resolution wise in terms of how film works, but it it, it certainly looks great. And mm -hmm. I think that's the mentality of how you approach it. Because with 16, you can you don't have to be as specific on the lighting. You know, or depending on the film stock you choose and all that stuff. And it's really light and compact, and you move through it and hide things and all that stuff. And so with DSLRs, it's kind of the same. Like, you know, even if you're shooting like, and we're talking about this right now on Assassin, but even if you're shooting, even if we got a red for free on layover, mm -hmm. what you can't do is, what you need is you need, like I said, that support system around it to get the great image. So you need the lights, you need possibly the generator, you need the crew to run those lights, mm -hmm. you need like the people there setting it up, you need the DIT guy who's sort of focusing on it. Like you kind of want that also, support system around that's it. not even including post because then you have to be able to edit right. in 4k and exactly. process it and have the memory and the you know so the camera's free and the lenses might be free mm -hmm. but you end up having to pay for it somewhere yeah at some time and it might be time it might be that you have to pay for it with time because mm -hmm. you're the only one doing it and you got to figure out a way to convert it whereas with dslrs you just it requires less yeah. and so one of the things I've said is like, you want to use the camera that's appropriate for what your production can support, not necessarily what your budget can support. Um, if we wanna know, and you don't have to give the answer to this, so obviously if you don't want to, um, last question before my final question, um, but does layover end happily ever after? Not in the way that you think, that's what I'll say. It is not a typical ending. It's very French. It's very French, actually. <laughs> Not to give anything away, but Carl said, this is so unrealistic. If this, these people were both French, they would have been in bed five minutes after they met. <laughs> I was like, Carl, we're making a movie, man. It's got to last, you know, yeah, 75 minutes. Yeah, the suspension minutes. of disbelief. <laughs> um, my final question to you, and I ask this to all the filmmakers that come through here, is that in your years that you've been making films, if there was something that you learned along the way that you wish you had known earlier that you could have shared, you could share now with your younger self or with a group of newer filmmakers like this, uh, what lesson would have saved you a lot of time and heart, heartache? Uh, just go and do it and find a way to do it. Uh, a quick elaboration, I, I spent a lot of time trying to write and make 
get films made that were out of the budget range I could afford or whatever. Yeah. And so I spent a lot of wasted energy trying to be a salesman and not be a filmmaker. Yeah. And the doors that have opened as a result of just going and doing it without regard to a lot of the stuff that a lot of people like, oh, it's there's stars in it, whatever, um, has been totally worth that experience. And so I'd go back and say, just continue making films, find ways to make films at any cost, mm -hmm. and just make it happen. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Let's give a warm round of applause for Joshua Caldwell. And thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so glad that you discovered the show. And for those who followed us for a while, they know that as our audience grows, so does the quality of the show. We get better guests like Josh here. We uh, get better brands involved, brands that care about what you know you care about. And then we keep getting better content about the topics that you want to hear about. So if you want to see more of these, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's WMM Originals and the iTunes podcast, How We Make Movies. And I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.